Good afternoon and welcome to Wintergreen Studios Virtual Band Art Bio Blitz. You are at the session What's Buzzing at Wintergreen Studios with Alex Pedersen. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Jess Pilo. I'm the project coordinator at Wintergreen Studios and I'm your tech support on the call today. And now I'd like to pass it over to our volunteer, Jessica, who is going to introduce our next speaker. Hi there. So I'm Jessica Sobe, and I'm just helping out as a volunteer with Wintergreen Studios. And I'm going to be hosting this session. So now I'm going to pass it over to Alex. Um, she is an avid beekeeper and board member of the Limestone Beekeepers Guild. She took courses in apiculture at the University of Guelph's Honeybee Research Center as an undergraduate student. And she is Wintergreen Studios' resident beekeeper, where she offers workshops on beekeeping, like this one, and takes care of our three hives. She's here today to give an update on our hives and answer your beekeeping questions. So take it away, Alex. Thank you so much, Jessica, and Jess, for all the wonderful work that you've been doing on the BioBlitz. I want to thank, to Wintergreen for uh, having me as a part of Project B, which I'll talk a little bit about. Uh, but honestly, I'm just, I'm always excited to talk about bees and beekeeping. So the more people that want to join me in those conversations, the better. So thanks so much for joining us here today. Uh, please call me Alex. Uh, in my, my day job, I actually work at Queen's University, but my passions lie with beekeeping, which my partner and I do during the warm summer seasons. We've been beekeepers now for a little over four years, and this is our second year with Project B at Wintergreen Studios. And uh, as Jessica said before, I got all of my background in beekeeping when I was at the University of Guelph at the Honey Bee Research Center. So it took me a while to land in place where I could actually have my own bees. But since then, we've been off to the races, collecting honey, raising colonies, and now we're sharing our knowledge and love of bees with other people. So I'm super pleased that you're here to share in that love with me. Uh, so I, I put together a very brief slide deck just because I wanted to show you some of the photos that we take both at the Wintergreen Studio Hives as well as in our own apiary, which is around Inverary, Ontario, for anybody outside of the Kingston area. Uh, and basically we're going to kind of look through of like who's in the hive, some of the importance of bees and why we should be protecting pollinators. And I just wanted to kind of leave it broad and open for you, but I'm very happy to answer any questions, no matter how small, like a bee or how big they might be. Um, we'll see what you have to say. So without further ado, I will move on in my presentation. So, and the wonders of PowerPoint. So for those of you who have not joined us in the last little while up at Wintergreen Studios, we've, we created the um, Ninth Meadow Apiary last summer as a part of Project B. And as you can see here, we have three hives, which I was really lucky to visit this morning. I went to go check on them. Uh, springtime is always a very, um, I would say difficult, but also a bit of a stressful time for beekeepers because the colonies are building. You're helping to get them started for the summer, but it's also the time of swarm season. And that's when bees biologically want to split. They want to spread themselves out but because there can only be one queen in a hive, they have to go in separate directions when there is more than one queen born in the spring. So I'm checking on them as often as I can to make sure that we don't lose the colonies to swarming and they find a new location somewhere else at Wintergreen. So for now, we want to keep them here. Um, and for the people that are on the call with me, I thought I would ask, maybe you notice that the bees are behind a particular fence. Does anybody know why we might keep the bees inside of an electric fence? Thanks, Monica. Yeah, sometimes to keep pesky neighbors out, or as Wes said, to keep bears out. Are there any other critters that we might want to keep out? You're both correct. Ooh, raccoons, that's a great one. Yeah, raccoons as well. Now raccoons might be able to slip underneath the electric fence, but our, our hope here is that if we ever have something as large as a bear, which we do have in the area around up by Wintergreen, is that we don't let the bears in to eat the bees. Now, most people think they go for after the honey, and that's definitely something that's sweet on their mind, but they're more interested in the bee larva, which is a protein for them. So when those you know, sleepy bears wake up in the beginning of the spring, first thing they wanna do is pack on the pounds and get ready for summer. And so they look for easy things like bees, even though the first thing they're gonna get 
is a little whop on the nose because that's where the bees go first to sting them. So here we go. We have one of our hives, one of the three hives here, and I've just given a little bit of, um, of an idea of what parts of a beehive we have. We have long straw hives, which are 10 frame boxes for the bees to live in. They live in the brood chamber, which is this here, this uh, larger box at the bottom. And this is where the queen lives. This is where she lays her eggs and the worker bees work with her to raise the eggs to larva, to pupae, and then out as worker bees when they emerge. So all of the bee production itself is what happens in the brood chamber. Above the brood chamber is the honey super. This is what humans want the most. So because I put in between the two frames uh, a queen excluder, she cannot crawl up to lay her eggs in the honey super. So the only thing that gets packed into the top box is exclusively honey. So in the fall or late summer when we take honey off, we can remove it from the hive and only have the purest, most wonderful honey and no extra bee bits to join in. The other thing that we have is the roof, and this is really good because it keeps the bees protected and there's a little bit of an overhang. You can't see it here, but there's actually a second entrance at the top underneath the roof, but the main entrance is here along the bottom. And you know what, why don't I just turn on the video so you can see them in action. So you can see I put it on a little bit of a slow-mo because I like to watch them fly a little bit slower, but you can see that they're clustered all around the entrance of the hive and they're coming in and out. When they're coming in, they're filled with nectar. Sometimes they have pollen on their pollen sacs. And then you have other bees that are sitting there at the entrance as the guard bees to make sure that the right bees are coming in or no wasps, bumblebees, or other types of predators might come inside the hive. So the very bottom here, underneath the entrance is the bottom board. At Wintergreen, we have a screened in bottom board. We like to have circulating air and that helps the bees to regulate the temperature within the hive. So I, I could watch these bees fly all day. Um, unfortunately, I don't have the sound on and in slow-mo, it's a little bit different to hear. But I think one of the most wonderful things about staying and seeing the bees is that, that wonderful hum that we hear when we're around them. And they're quite loud, especially when you have three hives together. So, there we go. Oh, we've got another one. So these are our bees. And I just wanted you to see how they, with a little bit of sound. I think it's the coolest thing to watch them in slow motion. When they're coming back into the hive, like I said, they're filled with, with nectar and they've often got pollen on their pollen sacs, which are on their back legs. They're often really heavy. So as you can see, they're not really good at landing. They often miss their landing spots, bounce around, and there's often times too where you'll see bees collide with one another. There's nobody um, there on the ground kind of giving them directions for flight or anything. So this is a really cool opportunity and there's just one going in there right now that had pollen pants on uh, to see what's happening um, throughout the day. So when I come up uh, to see the hives at Wintergreen like I did this morning, each one of the hives looked like this. And that's a wonderful sign for a beekeeper because you know that your bees are active, they're out foraging and collecting. And with the number of bees that I see at the hive entrance too, it makes me reassured that I know that my numbers and populations are going up in the summertime. Okay. There you go, those bees. Listen to that sound, it's so cool. So who lives in the hive? I've kind of said a few names of different types of bees that live in the hive, but does anybody know who lives in the hive? There's actually three types that live in the hive. So we have worker bees and queen bees. Who are we missing? Who can't we forget? Nice one, Wes. Yes, it's the drones, the male bees in the hive. We wouldn't want to forget them, eh? So let's have a look, see if we can identify what our bees look like inside the hive. Let's have a look here. Now, there's a couple of different bees in this picture and they, they're a little bit different than one another. What kind of differences do you notice? There is a long bee, right? Yeah, right here in the very center, it's the queen. So let's have a look at her. Isn't she gorgeous? The queen bee is the largest bee in the colony. She lays all the eggs in the hive. And in the summer, she can lay up to 2,000 eggs a day. That blows my mind. Like in, in roughly a few short weeks, 
she can populate her hive up to 80,000 bees at the height of the summer. And that's a lot of bees buzzing around, visiting, um, yeah, that's a lot of kids. It's a lot of kids to look after, right? Um, and that means that the colony is thriving and they're able to bring back lots of nectar that they're going to convert into honey. And I thought it would be really cool to show you how a queen moves because one of the hardest things to do for a beekeeper is to spot the queen. There's only one queen in a hive. And really for beekeepers, if you can find her, that's one of the best assessments for health of a hive. You locate her, you see the first laid eggs that she's done for that day, and you know that the queen is thriving. So let's watch how she moves a little bit differently than the other bees. This is a short video. You can see her here in the center. Oh, she's quick. And she just pushes those bees right out of the way, eh? Let's watch, can we watch that again? Watch her move. She's right here, moving along, pushing those other bees. She's on a mission. She's looking for a good place to lay the next round of eggs. So they're quite tricky. You have to have a very good eye to be able to catch the queen and to locate her. Then we also have the worker bees that are in there too, her daughters. Worker bees uh, tend to the hive and they collect pollen and nectar to feed the colony. So now one of the things here that I wanted to point out to you in this photo, this particular bee that's got the blue circle around it, she's a little bit older. She's a little bit farther up on the jobs that she needs to complete before she's allowed to go outside of the hive to forage. Right now it looks like she might be converting um, some nectar and adding some water to it and maybe they're making honey together. But those three little bees down there at the bottom look like they're having a bit of a conversation. The red circle that I've done here, this is a new bee. This is a, the babiest of baby bees, but maybe not quite as new as the one that I have pointing down here that is emerging from its comb. So this is the birth of a bee that we see here, one little antenna sticking outside of it. And that little bee will chew its way outside of the hive, uh, or pardon me, outside of their cell. And then the first job that she has of 12 jobs in her entire lifetime is that she has to turn around and clean out her own room. How's that for your first job when you're born? Hmm? Uh, last but not least, the drone, the male bee. Now, male bees or drones live in the hive throughout the season. They are larger than their sister worker bees, but they are smaller than the queen. You can recognize them by their large eyes and their fuzzy bodies. But the special thing about male bees is that they do not have a stinger, so they actually cannot sting you. Let's see this male bee. He's not very happy that I picked him up, so I do apologize to this drone. So see, he's got these big giant buggy eyes at the top. And so he stands out quite a bit more. Their eyes are a lot larger than their sisters and their mothers. So again, you look for these bees. There's about one drone for every 100 worker bees in the colony. And so there aren't very many of them, but their entire purpose in life is to go out on mating flights to look for other queens, different from their own genetics, to breed with them. Successful bees, successful drones that do this, unfortunately they die in the mating process. That is the end of their lives. And if they are unsuccessful, they often come back to the hive where they live and their sisters feed them throughout the rest of the summer. They never do any honey collection or nectar collection or anything like that. They just kind of sit there, hang out, and let their sisters feed them for the summer. So unfortunately in the fall, when it comes time to get ready for the winter, the workers and the queen don't see them as adding very much. So they kick all of the drones out of the hive when it comes time for the fall. So sorry, little drone bee. You only get, a, you only get one season with the hive. Here's a good one for everybody. If you have a look at your screen right now, this is a picture of a frame. And I promise you there's a queen on this frame. Do your best, and I would love to see if anybody can find the queen. Let me know when you do uh, by uh, chatting, into, or chatting in the chat and say you found her. Oh, Monica, you're quick. Jessica, well done. So here we go. Are you ready? I'm going to show you what, where she is and what she looks like. Boom. Did everyone find her? Now remember how quickly she moved too. So she's there for a second and then she's gone. So why do we need bees and other pollinators? What's really important about them? I mean, other than the fact that as a beekeeper, I really just want honey. 
right? At the end of the day, honey is the most, uh, the largest byproduct that we get out of beekeeping, and it is definitely one of the most delicious. So if we have a, I love this one because you can hear them and see them. They'll be lapping up using their tongue, the proboscis, um, and eating up some of the honeycomb and the honey that I accidentally broke open when I opened the hive one day. And because they don't want to lose a drop, they will suck it all up, take it all in, and they will re-put it into another comb elsewhere in the hive. So let's have a look at these little bees. So they're hard at work, so they're a little bit more quiet than they're usually doing their hum, right? All right, Oop, excuse me. There's other, so there's other things in the hive too that we really want. One of them, and I really wish this was smell-o-vision, I'm sorry it's not, but the other thing that we really love is wax. Wax is another fantastic byproduct that we have in the world that we use both for the wonderful smell of it mm, and making candles or lip balms or hand creams, things like that. But there's also a number of industrial products too that use beeswax. But this is a really intensive piece that bees need to make every year in that they actually produce wax from glands that are underneath their abdomen. And so it, it requires a lot of energy for a bees to make honey, or sorry, to make wax. And so as beekeepers, we only wanna collect the wax when it's absolutely necessary because it takes so long for them to actually create this. We don't wanna make them have to do it every year. The other thing that bees make that we collect as well as they do is pollen. And now I have the pollen in a bag here, and it's quite, you know, well put together, but you can see that those are actually tiny, tiny little pieces that would come back on the pollen sacks each day. People usually like these because it is, um, it helps you to become um, allergy resistant to some of your local um, flowers that might bother you in the spring, summer, or fall. Um, they like to put them into smoothies, salads, and other types of food products to kind of give them a little bit of an immuno boost. Uh, for the season. Uh, beyond that, and you know, our wonderful honey, there's also something called uh, resin. And resin is kind of like the cement that bees make. And we don't collect a lot of that. Really, it's the industrial scale beekeepers. And industrial scale is 50 or more hives. Those folks sometimes collect resin to, uh, to melt it down for use. Uh, but again, that's, uh, it's a very difficult thing to do. And so me as a small scale beekeeper, I don't do that. But it's really important that we think about the other pollinators that are in the area too, right? There's bumblebees at Winter Green. This is from this morning, a photo that I took, I should let you know. Um, there's also butterflies. These are other local types of pollinators. Some fly varieties as well are also pollinators. And while it's really exciting that we have the European honeybee or Apis mellifera, which is the type of honeybee that we have as beekeepers because it collects the most amount of honey, there are also native species that live around Wintergreen Studios as well as your own backyard that are really important to support as well. And so we wanna create a really diverse ecosystem and environment so that all of the pollinators can have access to food sources. Mm. And you know what? Sometimes they're nice about sharing their honey with other pollinators too. Oh, I love this one. Here's a little time lapse of uh, my partner Ryan and I working on our bees. And so opening up, this is sometimes how the pictures are made that we do, but it's a long process. We wear the full gear. I have no interest in being stung. There are some beekeepers that love to wear nothing when they're doing their beekeeping. Um, and that's great for them, but you have to do what's most comfortable for you when you're a beekeeper. Oh, there it goes pretty quick. We're getting into the last hive. Oh, I really wish it was that fast when we do it. So uh, the other reason that I would also uh, let you know about bees is that you there's lots of things that you can be doing about bees in your backyards. And I'm curious to know what you might be thinking about already. Are any of you planting um, you know, particular flowers or vegetables in your gardens this year that you wanna share with us in the chat? What are you doing to support pollinators in your own backyards? Milkweed, fantastic. We actually have some milkweed that sprouted up in our backyard this year and we're leaving it even though it's in the middle of the grass. A blazing star, love it. I love those plants, they're fantastic. That's great, those are some really good examples of things. Um, 
any type of flower that has multiple flowers, um, big open um, pieces so that the bees can fly into them, lots of pollinating uh, flowers as well. It's wonderful to plant local and native varieties in your backyard because those are the, the types of pollens and nectar sources that native bee species would be drawn towards. And so just as much as we want to support those European honeybees, we also want to be uh, supportive of other local bee species as well. So next time you're out, ooh, Sue, that's a great example. Bee bomb, and exactly in the name, is another wonderful source to actually be uh, sharing in your gardens as well. So I want to I want to share or turn it over to you because I wonder if you have any burning questions about bees. Now I've talked enough. I think it's your turn. Okay. So um, if Alex is ready, we will turn it over to the Q and A. So my question is: I live on the sixth floor of an apartment building. So part A would be: Would bees ever come up here? And <laughs> Part B would be, um, if they do, and I wanted to help, and I don't have a garden, is there something I can do in my tiny little balcony that might help? That's a wonderful question. Um, my recommendation, if you could um, have a hanging basket or a pot, or even there are those special boxes that you can put um, on the inside if you have uh, a railing. So that way it's on the inside of it and not the outside so it doesn't fall, of course, because you're six stories up. But if you wanted to put some nice flowers that maybe were um, overhanging or you know geranium types that have these big bulbs of flowers at the top, the scent, if there are bees in the area, will still draw them up. Um, you may still see bumblebees come up that high. Some um, forager type native bee species like a mason bee or a carpenter bee, they may not go that high, right? They're a little bit more ground level. For sure. Yeah, especially if they're already carrying some pollen, they might be yeah. a little too heavy for it. Yeah, but I mean, if you've seen a bumblebee fly, they are a, a physics feat in my mind. It always amazes me. They're little 747s that take off and just seem to have no trouble taking off, even though their bodies are giant pom-poms in comparison to the size of their wings. So yeah, I, I encourage you, put some flowers on your balcony. If not for you, do it for the bees. Yeah, maybe a little bit of both. <laughs> Okay, um, so we have a question from Monica. Um, do you have electric fence around your hives in Inverary? If no, why not? If yes, is it quite as robust as the fence at Wintergreen? And then she put in brackets, ahem, overkill. And what source of power did you use? Um, we do not have uh, an electric fence around our bees in Inverary. And one of the reasons that we don't is because they are um, fairly close to a house. Out in, um, out in the property that, that is there. We are fortunate enough to have friends that invited us to keep bees on their property. So they're around enough and there's enough farms around that, that particular area that there hasn't been many sightings, if at all, of bears. Um, so instead of an electric fence, one other thing that we do at Wintergreen, as well as in my own yard, is we actually have tie-down straps. And so we will secure the hive to um, a skid to make sure that if they were ever bumped or if an animal, like we definitely have raccoons and we definitely have skunks, if they ever came up and tried to lift the lid off, they don't have the ability to do that because it's tied down and we weigh it down. So thanks for your question, Monica. I'm sorry, I don't have an offense. <laughs> um, the next question is, how many bees are needed in a hive until it typically splits? 100, 1,000, 10,000? How many bees are needed until it typically splits? Ah, so a swarm in the spring, you're saying. So if a colony is weak, usually we don't count bees. They don't line them all up when they come out in the spring and ask them, okay, who made it, who didn't? Um, typically what we do when we open up the box, we look down and we see the 10 frames from the top, right? And so in the springtime, if bees are only you know, walking across the top when we first open it up, if they're only covering two to three frames, we know that colony had a really hard time in the winter and it's actually pretty weak. I would say there's probably anywhere between 1,000 to 2,000 bees at that point or less, depending how poorly they did. Then you can go up to bees across, you know, four to six frames. That's a, you know, it's good. It's about a medium. There's probably anywhere between five and 8,000 bees at that point. If we're lucky, you have strong, so you might have 10,000 bees over winter. If they're at 10,000 bees, if it's a really strong hive, 
they will already be thinking, oh no, we're gonna run out of room. And so when they start to think that they're gonna run out of room, the worker bees actually make a decision separate from the queen. It's not the queen who dictates things. It's not a hierarchy the way that we think about it. The worker bees might actually decide, okay, we need to make a new queen because we need to swarm and split or we will run out of room. So it's really about um, it's the strength of a hive, less or about actual numbers. Obviously those two correlate, but um, in the springtime, because it's their biological urge to split, they won't do it unless they feel as though they have two viable queens or more to be able to take half of the colony with them and survive. So. Fair enough. Okay, um, who would win in an arm wrestle, a drone or a worker? I think that's pretty interesting. Who would win in an arm wrestle, a drone or a worker? Well, I would like to think that the worker bee would win only because she's been out working really hard and building those muscles and the, and the male bee has been at home eating his honey and sitting around and not doing much. So, that's my answer to that. But if I ever see it, I will let you know. Okay. Um, this one says, while I understand that the role of drones is to mate with a queen, why are there so many drones in a hive? Are there that many queens flying around to mate with? That's an excellent question. I really like that one. Um, it's about being able to spread the genetic line. Like anything in nature, they often do things in robust because they want to ensure that the genetics are passed along. And so oftentimes there will be obviously more drones than there are queens to mate with. A queen will also mate with multiple drones when she goes out. And so um, when she is in her mating flight, the first male bee that comes and finds her will um, attach himself to her and inseminate her. And then unfortunately, when I said before, they don't make it out. Usually what happens is their genitalia breaks off when they separate. And so the male bee unfortunately falls and he dies. The next bee, next male drone that comes to the queen, he actually has to pull out the last bee's genitalia before he can insert his own, and then it continues on in the process. Again, she could mate with multiple drones from different colonies, and so there's different genetics that are going to be mixed into those bees. And so again, it's just about ensuring that there's survival and there's expansion. That was graphic. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of biology I feel and bee. bad for the poor drone. I do too. Um, <laughs> um, would a honeybee drone mate with other bee species? Oh, that's a wonderful question that I wish I had someone from the research center at Guelph to be able to answer. Yeah, as of yet, I have not seen it. That doesn't mean that there are not um, varieties of Apis mellifera, which is the, the honeybee that we discussed that beekeepers like. So there are different varieties. Some are buckfast. They come from um, England and Scotland. Buckfast bees are known for being exceptionally gentle. They, um, we had uh, one colony once that was a buckfast. Absolutely loved her. You could work without gloves. They didn't sting, um, but they had no aggression towards other bees. And so when wasps would come in to steal or eat larvae or steal honey from them, they weren't defensive enough. And so we actually didn't want to keep that particular type of bee. There's also, um, in addition to Russian, or sorry, European honeybees, there are Russian honeybees. Uh, they're very good at overwintering, as you might imagine. Uh, they're also quite robust in their honey collection. So I anticipate that because different beekeepers in Ontario might have different species of Apis mellifera, if it were, buckfast, Russians, European honeybees, those types, I think it's absolutely possible that they could interbreed with one another because they are, are of a family of that are the same, but I don't particularly see honeybees going out and looking out for uh, bumblebees or anything like that. So that would be a fun mix, I think. Maybe it would be um, sort of a, like if, if the numbers were low and like you say, they needed to increase the population, then they might go looking and they might not be as picky. <laughs> there you go. I'll have to look into that one. It's a good question. <laughs> Um, sort of similar, someone had a question, um, if they spotted a honeybee around their property in the city, would that be a sign that someone is beekeeping near them or could they just be wild honeybees? Mm, that's also a very good question. If you're, if you're really good at your bee identification, you can tell that it is a honeybee, uh, lesser than maybe a native species that might look quite similar. Honeybees can actually fly up to five kilometers away. 
So you might be within five kilometers of someone that has honeybees. Now, in accordance with the Bee Act of Ontario, you are actually not permitted to have your honeybees within the city limits. And so while I very much would like to keep a hive in my backyard, I choose not to because I know that that would be breaking the Bee Act. Um, so that's why we keep our hives up in Inverary because it is outside of the city limits. Um, so uh, you might have a radical beekeeper that keeps a beehive in their backyard and maybe they're not too far away from you. As long as you're not allergic and you're not uncomfortable, I think that's perfectly fine. You know what, if you find out there's a hive that's living next door to you, maybe they'll be so nice to share some honey with you. <laughs> If you don't rat them out. There you go. That's always, that was always the key. Make people happy with honey and they don't rat you out. <laughs> okay. We've only got um, one or two questions left. So anybody who's got something in their head and wants to ask, jump into that Q&A and ask it um, before we run out of time. Um, so somebody asked, what are pollen pants? Pollen. Oh, Monica asked. Okay, um, I can actually, if I stream back, and if everybody's okay with watching that really cool video, or at least cool to me, at the very beginning, there's actually a bee that comes in and she has two really big round yellow patches on her back legs. And so the back legs of a worker bee actually have extended hairs on them, and they act like little sacks. They actually, when the bee is inside of a flower, she brushes up against the stamen that has all of the pollen that's attached to it. And those little hairs start to pull and, and grasp everything and keep it together. So when they come in, they actually look like they have little saddle bags on the side of their legs and they're just chock full of pollen. And in the springtime, it's the most wonderful thing. This year we saw varieties of yellow, orange, pink, purple, blue, and green pollen coming in. So it just depended on what the bee was visiting. And another quirky thing about bees too is that they pick one source of food. So if you go out to a clover field and put a beehive out there, they will exhaust the clover source before they go out looking for other types of, of um, food sources. So that's how you can get things like clover honey, blueberry honey, or you know chestnut honey, weird things like that because they actually stick the beehives in a place where they can um, get those particular food sources and they collect as much as they can until that food source is exhausted. So those pollen pants that come in, let's turn on this video again, because it's pretty cool. I'm gonna see if I can watch her come in. And can you, Jessica, can you tell me if you see my mouse? I can. Okay, cool. I'm glad now that the presentation is over and I was doing that all the whole time. Uh, let's see the, the lady who comes in and she's got some pollen pants on. Most of these girls are coming back empty. Let's hope, oh, here she comes, here she comes. Oh, let's see if there's another one. There's another one coming in. Bat with pollen, see, it's stuck to the back of her leg. And so that's what I have here. Basically that round piece that was stuck to the back of her leg. I will put a pollen trap at the bottom of my hive exactly where this entrance is. So that way when the bees walk through it, it, it's a little bit smaller than they would be able to fit through if they didn't have pollen sacs completely filled. So when they walk through it, the pollen knocks off. I collect it at the bottom. But otherwise what they would do is they would stuff that pollen and that's one of the jobs of the worker bees that are inside the hive. They stuff it into the comb because it's protein. And so that's the first thing that they feed baby bees when they're in a larval state because it helps give them the energy that they need to pupate and then to emerge as worker bees. Awesome. I also did a quick just Google image search of pollen pants and mm -hmm. it's pretty adorable. Isn't it? And there's also, it's interesting, um, you'll, like you were saying, different colors, different types of flowers and plants. So there's a picture that I saw that's like all purple flowers and the pollen pants are purple. Yeah. It's very cool. So that's another thing to think about in your garden when you're planning and designing things. Sometimes the color of pollen can also make your bees really happy too. Yeah. Um, we've got a question. How much wax would it take to build, say, a beeswax candle in comparison um, to the wax in a full frame? A lot. <laughs> um, I... If I could actually quantify it, it would be really difficult because I've only in 
in three seasons of collecting wax. And so that was just wax that I would um, knock off from the hive that was from old frames that needed to be replaced. Um, I think my partner and I only made enough for a few, I wanna say two dozen um, small tea candles like this. So that was almost three years of collecting wax. Um, and, and it, was, it was quite a bit of work to do. I would probably say if you were to melt down the wax in an entire hive, um, while I don't recommend that, I would probably only make, you know, a dozen, half a dozen to a dozen candlesticks that you would have on your dining room table. There, there's not a lot in every hive. It's so important to the bees. So that's why mostly industrial scale beekeepers are the ones who collect the wax. Right, because it's a lot of work for them. So we don't want to, we don't want to make them Work I want them to focus on honey, yeah. not on wax. <laughs> okay, uh, I think this is going to be just about our last question. Will the different color um, of pollen affect the color of the honey? So it's actually the nectar that affects the color of the honey, lesser so the pollen. Pollen isn't used to make honey. It's used as that prope protein that feeds the bees. But you can get different varieties or colors of honey. Um, and it very much depends, again, that linkage that I said where it depends on the type of plant or the food source that they're using that dictates the color of the hive. And so in beekeepers use what's known as a jack scale to determine whether it's a white honey or an amber honey or a dark honey uh, and amongst the variety of scale of that. So by no means would you get um, uh, I'm just trying to think. There is actually an instance where I can actually think of one time I've seen blue honey. And that was because the bees got into sugar that a Cadbury factory had dumped outside and they found it as a very easy food source. It was dyed sugar that was blue and they bought it, brought it back to the colony and, and made it into honey. But typically it will be a white or a yellow or an amber or a dark color that you would see potentially in like Manuka honey, which is from New Zealand. Uh, so you won't see it come from the different pollen varieties that you have in your backyard. Awesome, all right. Um, the last question would just be how could people get in touch with you if they have more questions or want to learn more? Well, I, um, so as I was saying, or at the very beginning, we said I was a member of the Limestone Beekeepers Guild. Uh, and that is a website available to you at limestonebeekeepersguild.com. Uh, or you can find me through Project B and our program organizers, Jess and Monica. I think if they want to go through the Project B site and uh, think about ways that you maybe want to join us next year for some programming that we had. I should also mention, you know, Project B last year was awesome. We had four workshops, not only on introductory to beekeeping, we had building bee boxes, we even had honey collection and honey tasting last year. So everybody got to try different types and varieties of honey as well as imposter honeys. Uh, if you can think of what some of those might be. Um, as well as a winter wrapping uh, exercise that we did in November last year. Um, my, my best suggestion would to go, be to go through Wintergreen and Project B, um, not only because I think Wintergreen's an awesome place and everybody should be going there, but um, we're well connected with them, so I'm very happy to go through Monica or Jess if you have any questions or want to follow up. Perfect. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Alex, for your awesome presentation. I know I learned a lot, and I hope everybody um, who's watching also learns um, how they can help out in their community and to understand why it's so important. And I'm going to pass it back to Jess. Thank you so much, Alex, and thank you, Jessica, for hosting. I wanted to quickly share with you where you could find that information on our website on Project B. So if you go to wintergreenstudios.com, go to projects, and you can uh, look right on Project B here to see what Alex was up to this past year in our apiary, which is called the Ninth Meadow Apiary, um, as well as our work with Bee City Canada to become a Bee City school. Please enjoy your time outside and happy exploring.